Yoro! Hey guys, welcome back to the vlog. Today we're in Aurelia and we're going <laughs> snowboarding! Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna give you our ultimate snow kiting checklist. So let's go. First things first, if you're kiting on a frozen lake, make sure you bring a shovel to build a ramp and spice up your session. Don't forget to message your WhatsApp group and invite all your kite friends to go snow kiting with you, because you're going to need minions, I mean helpers, to build that ramp. You don't want to do it all by yourself. In Ontario, snow kiting usually requires a good amount of driving, so make sure you carpool so you have good company and you can split the gas costs. Don't forget spare change so you can grab a round of hot coffees on the way. We've said it before and we'll say it again, the four basics needed for perfect snow kiting conditions are wind, snow, a snow covered field or frozen lake, and a good foundation of snow. Now if you're thinking of snow kiting on your local mountain, we're not going to lie, we haven't done it, but Laurent has, and we've linked his channel in the description below. That being said, we've got plenty of tips for people living in flatter places. When it comes to wind, 8 knots will get you going with specific gear, but in general 10 knots is a minimum to mow the lawn. The real fun starts at 15 knots and up. Usually we don't go snow kiting in Ontario over 30 knots because the wind is just so gusty, it's not enjoyable. Of course, the wind could be different where you kite, so make sure you check with your local crew. What about snow? How much snow do you need? 15 to 30 centimeters is plenty. Less snow than that is manageable, but beware, your bales will hurt more. More snow makes for softer landings, but walking to the setup spot may get you pretty tired. Also, in lighter conditions, a lot of snow may get you stuck, literally. Obviously, not just any field or snow-covered lake will do. You need one that has at least two kilometers of clearance so you have nice, clean wind. The more the better, five kilometers plus is preferred. If you're considering a frozen lake, you definitely want to make sure that the ice is thick enough, at least 10 centimeters thick. When it comes to the ice thickness, we usually rely on ice fishermen to tell us how thick the ice is. However, if there aren't any around, then you can definitely use an ice screw or a drill to find out just how thick the ice is. You'll also want a good foundation of snow. Powder on top of ice is usually a no-go, and slushy conditions are also not favorable, unless you like getting cold and wet. Also beware of softer spots of ice closer to the shoreline. If you're snow kiting on a field or even a frozen lake where there's been ice fishing, beware of obstacles that may be hidden under fresh snow or not visible until they're right in front of you. We recommend walking 200 meters out from shore on frozen lakes. For inflatables and stronger winds, you may want to use an ice group with a rope and carabiner as an anchor for your bar for launching and landing solo. A lot of our fellow kiters use these, but to be honest, we never have. You may want to set up your lines first and then pump your kite as your kite may slide on the snow. If you're on a high traffic lake with snowmobilers, you may also want to bring some colored rods, caution tape, or small pylons to mark your setup spot. Obviously, you'll want to keep your footprint to a minimum, make sure you wrap your lines when you're taking a break, and avoid having your gear spread out so all your fellow kiters have space as well. It's all too easy for a snowmobiler to run over your lines, or someone may accidentally kite over them. For snow kiting, you'll likely be using smaller kites than you would use on water in the same wind. The amount of snow and type of snow does play a role in what kite to choose. If you're kiting in deep snow, your kite size will likely be similar to that you would use on water. For minimal or hard pack snow, you'll definitely be using a smaller kite. We recommend that you select your kite with gustier conditions in mind. A good rule of thumb is to go down a size from what you'd use on the water. So for example, if you'd be out on a 15 meter in water, use a 12 meter for snow kiting. If you're not sure, opt for the smaller kite first. Being overpowered when you hit an ice patch isn't fun or safe at all. It's always better to be safe than sorry and to bring multiple kites with you just in case. Unlike the summer months with the summer heat, you don't have to worry about damaging your kites by leaving them in the car. Many kiters prefer foil kites for snow kiting. They're easier to set up and go than inflatables. Plus, pumping and attaching lines in the cold isn't that fun. In our experience though, both types of kites will work just fine. You don't need to buy a specific kind of kite for snow kiting, unless of course you want to. Another important item to consider is your harness. I prefer the seat harness. I use a waist harness. Here, I don't know about the waist harness. I never tried it, but I'm afraid it's going to raise my jacket like that. So, I prefer seat harness. Why? Uh, because it's comfy. So your form tends to be a bit better with a waist harness if you're able to use your core. The seat harness, it's not bad, but I find it's actually in snow pants, really hard to bend and kind of reach over because it's just, it's a little bit constricting. Yuri and I are definitely in the minority though, as most of our fellow kiters opt for seat harnesses when it comes to snow kiting. So should you go with a snowboard or should you go with skis? 
We recommend you use what you're most comfortable with. You'll require less wind for skis, but a snowboard will provide a closer experience to kiteboarding on the water. I learned to snowboard before I learned to kite, so that's why I've stuck with the snowboard. Yuri didn't know how to ski or snowboard before snow kiting, so he opted for a snowboard due to the fact that it was closer to his regular kiteboard. There are dedicated snow kite boards, like this Nobili board our friend Dennis uses. This is our Nobili board. The main key of this is uh, the side cut. The radius is 20 meters, so it's pretty much flat. So when you're going on a straight line, you're going on a straight line. The board is not trying to curve. Therefore, your, your foot is not vibrating and you're not having any pain in your muscles. So you can ride for hours and it feels like you're just walking. Many of the local kiters, ourselves included, use flow bindings because they're easy to get in and out of. There are other binding options on the market, but regular snowboard bindings will also work, although they kind of can be a pain to get in and out of. Please don't rush putting your snowboard on, otherwise you'll end up like this. Depending on your bindings, you can make adjustments for additional comfort while riding. So, on the hill, I, I prefer bringing my heel up just so that it forces you to bend your knees when going downhill. But if you have this jacked up when you're snow kiting, you're going to blow your legs up just because your knees have to bend so much as is. So if you bring it back all the way, then it helps to uh, save your legs a little bit. As we mentioned before, a pro for skis is that you need much less wind to get going. Another advantage is that you can ski out to the setup spot or you can ski back if the wind dies. All right, so you've got the right conditions, you've got the right kite, and you've got your skis or your snowboard. So what's next? Uh, just get out there and do it. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, because if you miss any of the following essentials for snow kiting, your session could be a total disaster. So without further ado, here are eight must-have essentials for snow kiting. Number one, a helmet. You'll want a helmet for the obvious reason of protecting your head from hitting hard surfaces like ice or objects that may not be clearly visible in the snow. Beyond a helmet, you may also want to consider additional safety gear like knee pads. Helmets also help keep you warm, and they're not too expensive, so there's really no reason not to have one. You can attach a two-way helmet headset so you can easily talk to your kite buddy or listen to music while riding. And of course, you can always mount a GoPro to it. Just don't forget to bring extra batteries on those colder days. Number two, goggles. Not only do goggles help protect your eyes, but they improve your visibility on snowy and sunny days. They're also pretty stylish too. Number three, dress in layers. Yeah, you want to dress in layers just so that you can uh, put on a middle layer and then an over the top coat. And then you can, you're going to get warm. That's the thing with snow kiting. It does use up a lot of energy and you tend to warm up and sweat a bit. So if you have to take off a layer, it's pretty easy too. Breathable moisture wicking fabrics are also important to have if you want to snow kite for hours on end. We recommend dressing in layers because even on colder days, you may find yourself hot when snow kiting. We like merino wool, but any synthetic moisture wicking fabric would do. It's also not a bad idea to have a spare change of clothes in the car, just in case what you're wearing is not quite warm enough, or if you want to change up after your session is done. Number four, proper gloves. Just like kiting on the water, your hands are more prone to getting cold first, so a pair of proper gloves is definitely essential. Yep, have uh, mitts underneath, and definitely have a warm glove after. A pro tip for those really cold days is to use those hot pockets They'll help keep your hands and your feet extra warm. Number five, a good jacket and a pair of snow pants. A proper snowboard jacket and a good pair of snow pants will help keep you extremely comfortable while you're snow guiding. We prefer the dedicated snowboard jacket because they have zippered vents which will help keep you from overheating on milder days. Snowboard jackets are also slightly longer than ski jackets and this helps keep the snow from going up your back. Something else you may want to consider is your snowboard jackets and your harness and the positioning of both because if your harness goes right over your pockets, you could have things like your keys or your cell phone digging into you while you're riding, which is far from ideal. Number six is a balaclava or a neck warmer. When you're snow kiting, the less exposed skin you have, the better, and this is especially true for your face and your neck. I like full coverage and opt for a balaclava. Another great option is a merino wool neck warmer that you can pull up to your goggles if you need to. Trust us on this one, a balaclava or a neck warmer will definitely help to keep you snow kiting that much longer. Tip number seven, hot tea. If you're thirsty, eat some snow. Yum, yum. While not required, you should consider bringing some snacks, or even better, a barbecue. 
Nothing tastes better than barbecue in minus 20 degrees Celsius. It brings you back to that summer state of mind. Number eight is proper boots. <laughs> Make sure to wear proper boots as your surfing booties won't suffice. Life jacket is also not required. Warm socks are a definite must have. Wool socks are our personal go-to, plus a pair of boots for driving or just to change into once we're done our session. If you have a considerable walk to the setup spot, you may also want to bring a sled to haul your gear, or you may even want to bring snowshoes. All right guys, that concludes our list of eight essential must-haves for snow kiting. Make sure to like or leave a comment below and let us know if we've forgotten anything. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye!